pebble in my shoe. I'm Miffy Hold and I host the conversations with my guests here. I'm fascinated by the process of personal growth and so in this podcast we set out to drill into the internal journey that is instigated by the proverbial pebble. The pebble in my shoe is an analogy for an inner niggle or knowing that becomes so insistent that we have to pay attention. It's usually something that needs to change. We can ignore it only for so long and eventually have to stop to investigate it, listen to it and honour what it's telling us. It becomes a catalyst for action to change something that no longer serves us. This can be something internal, like a belief or mindset. It can be about how we behave in certain situations or relationships. Or it can be something that changes our life trajectory, like ending a relationship, changing careers or moving to a different place. Taking the action and making the change invariably requires courage, often a leap of faith and at the very least to try something new and outside of our comfort zone. Whatever the action or change happens to be, the pebble ultimately moves us to live more authentically, more aligned with our true nature. In this episode, I'm talking to Claire Wood. Claire is a money mentor, author, speaker and podcaster. She describes herself as a gym junkie, a drinker of wine, a passionate traveller, a wrangler of two young boys, a manifester, a numbers nerd and a reality TV addict who lives in her waterfront home by the beach in Gold Coast, Australia. She's a qualified accountant, a CPA, but she's not your average bean counter. She uses her money-making mentoring powers for good. Claire helps service-based businesses to scale while creating a lifestyle they love. Claire Wood runs the Profit Academy, an online school created to help business owners increase their profits exponentially. It's lovely to share our conversation here with you. So, hi, Claire. It's lovely to have you here on the podcast. Lovely to be here, Mickey. <laughs> Yay. So, you're in the Gold Coast of Australia, I understand? I am. The beautiful, sunny Gold Coast that actually is quite cold today. But normally, it is, it's beautiful and warm here as well. What's quite cold for you, Claire? Well, this morning it was seven degrees Celsius. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, that is quite cold, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah, because I laugh when people say quite cold when compared to Ireland because, yeah, we've, but we've had a particularly cold summer this year um, with a cold northeasterly wind a lot of this this year. Yeah, so I've been given out about it because I just am not happy yeah. with this cold <laughs> summer this year. <laughs> so, Claire, tell us about yourself. Just an overview of what you do and what you're about, please. Yeah, for sure. So hi, everyone. My name's Claire Wood. I am a money mentor and I really empower business owners to grow their business through managing their business finances. So actually, I'm a qualified accountant. I'm a CPA and I help people to understand their business finances. And I also do a lot in the space of money mindset. So helping people to understand their fears, their limiting beliefs around money, and then how they can actually consciously shift how they feel about money so that they can make more money. Cool. That's brilliant. Thank you. I love the fact that coaching, you can coach for anything and people niche down into what they know and what they're good at and what they're passionate about and then help other people in that area. So that's really cool. Thank you for that. Obviously, on this podcast, we talk about the pebbles in our shoes and we talk about the things that have instigated changes in our lives. So what do you want to tell us about that? what's been a pebble in your shoe that uh, we could share with our listeners? So the main thing that springs to mind, funnily enough, because I'm a, a money coach, is around money itself and me thinking about how drastically my relationship with money is now different to when I was growing up. Okay, yeah. So what was it like for you growing up? So I'm one of five children. Um, 
I do have two stepsisters as well. So, um, but I, I guess growing up, we didn't have a lot of money. You know, we did have a loving home and a safe home, which um, I recognize a lot of people are not privileged to have, but we certainly didn't have any of the luxuries that, for example, my children have grown up with. Uh, traveling overseas, I didn't go overseas for the first time till I was 23. Eating out at restaurants, I, I can't, the only time I remember in my childhood eating out was for my dad's 40th. We went out for dinner, Mm. but it wasn't something that was a regular in our lives. Whereas my children, you know, we, we eat out regularly. They've been to many different countries and yeah, I feel very, very blessed that that is, you know, where my world is right now as compared to what it was like for me growing up. Mm. And were you consciously aware of that as a child? I mean, I know that generationally things change, right, in societies, right, and and culturally we change. And so, you know, there wouldn't have been as much money generally. Maybe I'm being devil's advocate here, but were you conscious as a child that maybe you had less than others or was it more, you know, sort of culturally okay that you weren't eating out at weekends and things? Well, this is the interesting thing because I wasn't aware of it at all because everyone in our social circles were in similar financial positions. Um, I did have some friends that went to private schools and I did have some friends that would go on holidays and stay in apartments. But for the most part, a lot of the people that we socialized with were in a similar financial position to us. And the thing, the reality is, and this is something that I've learned about is that because I said to a friend of mine, oh yeah, when we grew up, no one had anything. And now, you know, everyone's got a lot. And she said, looked at me and she had a big smile. She said, no, Claire, you just mix with different people now who, you know, go overseas all the time. She's like, there are still a whole bunch of people who cannot afford to eat out at restaurants who haven't been overseas. You're just mixing in different circles now. And it was a real aha moment for me because I sort of had that thought as well. I said, oh, well, you know, back then no one had any money. And that's actually not true. (laughs) It was just that in my world, not a lot of people had money. Um, So, yeah, I, I definitely think that it wasn't something at the time that I was super aware of because Mm. it wasn't really being rubbed in my face or anything that, yeah, because like I said, everyone that we were socializing with was probably struggling financially too. But as I've gotten older, I've realized, you know, how much we didn't do in our childhood and things that were very normalized to me that, you know, for example, having secondhand clothes. Yeah. And <laughs> now I'm like, oh, I thought everyone did that when they were growing up. I thought that everyone's mum did their own hair um, at home and I didn't realise that there were people that did go to the hairdresser Mm. to get their hair done because that just wasn't financially an option for us growing up. And, yeah, I guess my real big aha change when it came to money really happened when I moved to the UK in when I was 25 years old. I'd finished my uni degrees and I moved over and yeah, I was on 40,000 pounds, which at the time was about a hundred thousand Australian dollars. And suddenly I, sorry, 60,000 pounds I was on by the time I left. And I realized, whoa, I had all this disposable income. I was having so much fun. I was traveling I went all through Europe. I was able to treat people, like pay for rounds of drinks and take people out for dinner. I flew my brother over. Oh, sorry, he flew himself over, but I paid for him to travel through Europe. I surprised him with a a trip around Europe. And all of a sudden I realized, oh my gosh, having money is fun and it's freeing and it's great. And that's sort of when I had my first big shift in the space of how I thought about it. Because I'm curious then about, your motivation towards the sort of career path you were taking or that. So what did you study in uni? Mm. 
So I studied accounting and funnily enough, that played into, I guess, some of the childhood stuff. So my dad had worked as a travel agent for most of my childhood, which is not very well paid at all. And then he'd gone and done an accounting degree when I was in my teenage years. And that was the first real time in our life where I remember we bought brie cheese and we moved into a new house where we weren't sharing bedrooms. And it was like, whoa, this was, you know, on a very minor scale. (laughs) But, you know, that was sort of the first time when we realized, and I associated, he did a uni degree and then he broke out of that, you know, living right on the the line of poverty. So I did exactly the same uni degree as him. Funnily enough, two of my brothers have done Mm -hmm. the same degree as well. Um, talk about a subconscious belief system. Like we're like, oh, do do a finance degree, and um, you know, it'll it'll change mm. your financial situation. So that's why I went down that path. Um, you know, in my school, I think two other people went to university. I, I was in a really low socioeconomic area. No one went to university, and it was really hard to be. You know, people started getting jobs. Mm. And I was still just a poor uni student for the next (laughs) couple of years. Uh, But, yeah, I'm really, really glad, obviously, that I did it because it's paid off I like that. Yeah, I mean, I was just curious about that because when I was at school, say about a third of my schoolmates would have gone on to third level. And it was quite normal not to in the 80s, you know. So, yeah, I'm just curious around all of that, around the driver, really, for going on. So, well done. You got your degrees in uni and you talk about coming over to to London and so on. I'm curious about that feeling then of being affluent because you're describing about how much fun it was and, and, you know, how you can do so much more and you can treat people and all of those things. And you grew up without very much, without that luxury. You talked about a shift in you. So talk to me about that shift, Claire, please. So the big two words that spring to mind for me, firstly, is confidence. Mm -hmm. Being able to, I know this is quite superficial, but I'm going to be honest, you know, being able to buy nice clothes, (laughs) being able to get your hair done, being able to, when someone says, do you want to do something? Say, yeah, I can do that. And that kind of links to the second one, which is freedom. And when you are so used to just, no, I can't do that. No, it's not even an option. People don't even ask you to do things because they know that it's not going to happen. And then being able to make choices like that, it feels just so freeing. Um, I remember when I was a uni student and I used to go out, um, there were bars. I don't think you can do this anymore, but back then in the, the late 90s, they used to have $1 drinks before, if you got in before eight o'clock at night, all drinks were a dollar. And being a female, um, I used to get often free drinks from the bar stuff. And so I would go in before eight o'clock, I'd buy 20 drinks, 20 drinks before 8 p.m. And then I would use my student bus pass. I had to be on the bus at 12 o'clock at night. So that was my nights out. I'd spend $20. I'd hang on to these drinks all night. I think about it now and just think, oh my goodness, how dangerous to leave drinks lying around. But anyway, and then later on, you know, I'd be able to catch a taxi home and just thinking, wow, this is so abundant. This is so amazing to just be able to have the convenience and the freedom to make choices like that. Yeah. And I suppose what I'm hearing in there, though, is an awareness in you, an appreciation in you of that, you know, that when you were able to get a taxi home, you were aware that, wow, this is so much better than jumping on a bus at 12 o'clock because I've got no other choice but to get this bus. Um, I'm, I suppose, personally listening in, feeling into what you were saying about, because uh, you said this might be superficial, but you know, it's nice to have nice clothes. And I totally get that because growing up like that, hand-me-downs was the norm for for us as well growing up. And yeah, there wasn't anything superfluous in, in our home growing up at all. But personally, I had to overcome this kind of inverted snobbery is what I call it now, that idea that 
having nice things and, you know, investing in comfort and luxuries was somehow shallow. You know, I had to overcome somebody else's belief around all of that, right? Um, can you talk to us, Claire, a bit about that mindset piece? So I'm just interested about your journey with your mindset around money because that stuff that is instilled in us like you you know even you describing how for you you had subconsciously associated doing a, a degree in some kind of finance would be your sort of ticket out and your brothers did the same thing so there is this sort of subliminal thing message that we get from our childhood isn't there and I'm really interested in all that stuff right that's that's the the crux of this this uh, podcast and the conversations I have here is is the process and what happens internally so if you could just talk a bit about the shift in mindset for you and at what point did it become a conscious decision to shift your mindset please yeah absolutely so I remember when I first learned about money mindset a friend of mine was doing a course with a money mindset mentor And my friend said to me, Claire, I think you'll really like this. I think that should we do it together? I think that's something you'd find really interesting. So she shared this mentor. I started following her and I was just blown away the way that she spoke about wealth creation, about being a millionaire. And yeah, it just really sort of opened my eyes to a whole level of conscious thinking, even though there'd been that unconscious shift when I moved to London, this was a conscious like, oh, wow, you can actually start to think differently about money. Sorry, can I just ask you, how old were you? You know, at what point sort of in your career were you at this stage when you started? So this was when I had started my own business and I would have been about 36 years old. Okay. So this was quite later in my life that I had my first learning around money mindset. Yeah. And, and what was that like? I mean, you said how it it was kind of mind blowing that you could actually think your way rich sort of thing. So talk to me a bit about that, please. Yeah. So what I learned from this mentor was, I guess how without meaning to, we, hold ourselves back and we don't allow ourselves to want big things, to desire big things because of all of the stories that we have about money. Um, She calls the money blocks, the things that block us from our next level of success. So an example of that might be, I don't think that I can um, ever have a big house because I don't deserve to. And then all of the stories, like I think about some of the stuff that was said In my childhood, uh, my dad spoke quite negatively about the rich and the elite. Mm. And he used to say, you know, oh, that's the rich. And um, there was a lot of negative connotations with wealth Mm. sitting in my subconscious mind. And when I was listening to this mentor, she cracked open that actually women entrepreneurs tend to give more, tend to create more impact, tend to be more generous, both with people they know and in terms of charities and things like that. And she also opened up that anyone could be wealthy. And I invested to go along on a retreat that she hosted. It was $10,000 for this retreat. And that was a lot of money for me. I did not have the money. I had to go on a payment plan. (laughs) And when I met her, I came back and everyone says, oh my gosh, was it worth all that money? And I remember that I said, do you know what? It was, and they're like, why? What was it that you learnt? And I said, I just learnt that anyone can be rich. There was, I mean, she's a lovely person, but there was nothing. She was just, you know, rocked up on day one. She had a pair of overalls and a pair of socks on, and she was just a nice down-to-earth, everyday kind of person who just decided to be rich. Mm -hmm. And that was the big aha that I had in that room, was realising that, making the decision and saying, I am going to allow myself to want big, crazy things 
is the first step in the right direction. And she built a, a you know, a, her dream house on the beach and that cracked open for me. And I'm like, I always, I love the beach, but it just didn't even occur to me that I could ever live at the beach. People like me don't do that. And fast forward now, I actually live in a beachfront property. We've got 18 meters of beach at the back of our house. Wow. Don't quite have the dream mansion yet. Um, let's just say that the house, we lovingly call it the beach shack, but that was where it got cracked open for me. And then I took actions and steps towards that goal and it's now my reality. And there's been so many examples of that that have happened, um, you know, I, I wanted a Tesla. We got a brand new Tesla. I wanted a boat and we got a boat and it's just all by actually saying, what do I want? And then allowing ourselves to go and chase those big goals. Yeah. Yeah. And what I'm hearing throughout all of this is that our mindset creates our reality, right? And, and so different mindset, different world. Yeah. And, and we use that in our language, don't we? We'll talk about, oh, that person, they just live in a different world. But that is kind of how it is, isn't it? Because you're talking earlier on about how you surround yourself with different people and it's like attracts like sort of thing. And I suppose the question that's formulating for me now, Claire, is what difference does it make in your life now that you have your beachfront home, your boat, your Tesla, all of that? What difference does that make to you as a person, you know, as yeah, look, I think that my confidence is so much greater and I don't know which came first, the chicken or the yeah. egg, to be honest. Um, I mean, I feel like I could lose things now and still be able to rebuild again, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, I truly believe in impossible dreams and I know that not just from my own life but from helping my clients to achieve so much mm -hmm. You know, I remember first calls with people. It's always so interesting that people say, I want to make, you know, $20,000 a month. And I'm like, really? That's your big goal? And then, you know, when they hit the $50,000 mark um, a month and I'm like, do you remember your big goal was $20,000 a month? And just being able to witness that journey of people just expanding and saying, I want an investment property and then buying it. I want to take off and go traveling. I want to work four days a week and witnessing that growth, which witnessing the change that will happen when people allow themselves to desire big things. And, and I want to really say this, take action to get there. Mm -hmm. It's not just, oh, I think about, I think positive and then suddenly I've got a boat. It's not that at all. Of course you were taking actions to create those outcomes. So I think that that's also very important to highlight is that, action is a big part of it as well. Mm. Yeah, you're reminding me of um, some of the action that I would have taken over my life would have been around shifting, yeah, those inner beliefs and acting as if mm -hmm. was my mantra. So I'm going to act as if I am X, Y, or Z, whatever that might be. And that mightn't be around money mindset necessarily. It might be around some kind of virtue I wanted to hold or some way I wanted to show up, right? Um, so you act as if you are confident or as if you are, you know, whatever it might be. So acting as if you're wealthy or a first step for me was buying my favorite perfume, which is quite expensive as perfumes go. And that for me was an act of abundance for myself. I, I want this for myself. And again, you know, I can feel even now after all these years of working on this stuff for myself, wanting to justify it, you know, in this conversation, because those beliefs are so entrenched and so deep in us uh, that even yet yeah, it'll come up that we have to sort of say, well, you know, I know that might sound shallow, but and it's not mm. It's because it's it's that acting it out that you're describing. It's those taking actions that actually affirm to us that we are worth that, I think. And that's the piece for me around all this. What does it do for us personally inside when we step into claiming abundance for ourselves? 
because personally it was about self-worth it was about deserving and it was about me being good enough to have so yeah I'm I'm interested in that for you Claire personally what what is it for you internally that this does yeah and I think that as I said earlier like the confidence the self-worth and for me a big part of it as well is impact because I, in the kind of work that I do, when I have an up level, it's not just me that it affects, it's all of the people in my audience, you know, the listeners on my podcast, my clients. I really believe that it has a positive knock on effect as well to other kinds of people as well. So there's that. Um, it's obviously also changing, generationally changing. You know, I've come from a you know, a line of of poverty, then probably myself borderline poverty and being able to raise children that are, that are confident and that really say, I can do that and I can have that and uh, having big dreams. And so there's also that impact component that really jumps out to me as well. Yeah. Yeah. You said something earlier on um, and that was about that if you lost it all, that you now have the confidence to rebuild. And I'm interested in that piece, right? Because there is this kind of fear, I think, sometimes around losing everything. And for me, happiness or contentment is is actually not about the stuff. It's about how I am inside. And I'm so I'm interested in that piece around what you said. So can you just flesh that out a bit? for what that is for you, Claire, that if you lost everything and you know you have the confidence to rebuild, like what would that look like even? Yeah, for sure. And I think that this is, um, I guess, the crux of this. Like stuff isn't going to make you happier and money isn't going to make you happier in and of itself. Uh, I think that that's one of the greatest mistakes that we all make and a belief that we may all have is when I get to this destination, I'll feel this. But the truth is, and we know this, uh, you know, this Tesla I'd wanted for maybe years. And then when I got it, I mean, it's really amazing. And I, Mm. but it's, it's like, oh yeah, I got it. You know, does that make sense? Like the accomplishment Mm. of the goal isn't often as glorious as we think it will be. Mm. Um, Mm. And even if it is, it's not long lasting. Like it's a really amazing moment when it happens, but it doesn't provide us with fulfilling joy. There's this, oh gosh, I wish I could remember his name. Dan Biltzerian. I don't know if you've heard of him. He's this poker player. He's, uh, you know, a womanizer. He's, yeah, if you ever go and look him up, you'll see that his, his page is full of, semi-clad women and him muscle bound and all of this. And I remember this interview with him and he said, it doesn't make you happy. None of this stuff, like you reach a point where you get incremental happiness, but then you reach a point he, where, you know, he goes, I think he bought a new car and he like a Ferrari or something. And he said, I felt good for about five minutes. And that's why through the process of wealth creation, we need to be also doing it with from a sense where there's a greater sense of worth, of desire. And again, that's why impact is so important to me as well, because it's not just about me getting stuff or mm. creating wealth. It's about the, being able to help more people, being able to inspire mm. more people. And I think that that's something really important to remember on that journey. Yeah, because that's the bit for me. It, it it It's that meaning and purpose part, right? Mm. Because I think we all need meaning and purpose. And if you can be so wealthy that, you know, you've got somebody who's going to actually make you breakfast and bring it to you in bed, if that's your desire, you know. And for me, oh, no, I want to get up and I actually enjoy the whole ritual of making my own breakfast. Now, I'm just using this as a sort of a hypothetical example, right? But, you know, when you're so abundantly rich financially that you can have whatever you want, then you have to be very kind of mindful about what you want because otherwise you're just going to lie in the bed all day clicking your fingers and is that really maybe it is what you want but is that meaningful and is that purposeful and does that serve your fellow man you know and I suppose 
I'm also hearing in there um, echoes of the sort of re- research around hedonism and, and that sort of thing, right? So there is lots of evidence and research into this whereby poverty is stressful for people. Not having enough is a grind and is really impactful on people's health and well-being. There is loads of evidence to say that. So, you know, people living the kind of upbringings that you and I had where we didn't have very much. There's a level of stress always because you're living hand to mouth. Then what happens as we get a bit more affluent is that that stress is reduced because we're not worrying about where the next meal is coming from. We're not worrying about how we're going to put shoes on the kids' feet. And so that stress is alleviated and we become more at ease because we can tend to other things and Maslow's hierarchy of needs comes in here and all sorts right so that we are able to self-actualize when we don't have to worry so much about food and shelter and so we are happier in adverted commas when we have a bit more and there is this kind of window then of wealth whereby those stresses go and we have what you're describing in your 20s when you were in Europe and you know, you had this freedom because you had more money and it was fun and it was it was great. And then there comes this point where actually that happiness and contentment and freedom and joy part, that window closes again because other stresses come in because you have to be more protective of your wealth, if you like, and, and, and all of that stuff. And it doesn't actually bring that same level of joy. So it, that's the bit that also fascinates me. Because for me, a lot of what comes in here then is gratitude and about appreciating what we have and being able to be happy and content and know that we can manifest what we need through our mindset. So it's not so much about the stuff and what we have. It's about how we live in that world. And we're talking about worlds as well here. But I'd I'd be just interested to hear your take on that area of hedonism versus happiness and and so on. Oh, yeah, I totally agree with exactly what you were saying. And, uh, you know, if people aren't familiar with the term of of hedonism, hedonistic adjustment, it's essentially that you will form a new level of happiness in whatever circumstances or a new level of normal in whatever circumstances unfold for you. So, for example, if you were suddenly living in a cave, you would feel incredibly unhappy initially. You would be missing, you know, having a roof and a blanket. And then, you know, as the weeks and months go on, you would adjust and you'd just be quite become quite used to and accustomed to that. And that's what that concept is. Yeah, I think that mindset is about the power of being able to find our happiness and our gratitude in even really challenging times, challenging situations, and also still being open to better outcomes and options and saying, I believe that I will get through this, or I believe that there's something ahead for me. And I think that there's a lot to be said about having that really find balance between having a a belief in, in creation of more while equally being happy with what you've got yeah yeah that's lovely can I ask you Claire then do you have a practice around this like do you know a daily practice like a meditation or affirmations or do you know what what is your practice to maintain that in yourself because it's not just a case of getting rich and oh well sure here we are (laughs) do you know how do you maintain and grow internally in this space for me this has changed over the years. Um, I don't have a specific practice that I have to do every single day to feel abundant. Um, There are periods where I might be, right, I'm going to be meditating every day or I'm going to be journaling every day. But it sort of, for me, has evolved a little bit from there. And I don't think for me at this stage that I have to be doing certain things And nor do I think that it's helpful to be going through the motions just for the sake of it. So, you know, like if every day, for example, if I was feeling money was feeling really, really tight and I'm like, I'm rich, I'm rich, I'm rich, I'm rich. And I was just, I was sitting there thinking, no, I'm not. Mm -hmm. I don't think that that's actually 
conducive to shifting your subconscious belief system. And so that's why at different stages of my growth, I'm looking at different practices and different strategies and evolving it as time goes on. Mm -hmm. Um, At the moment, I mean, I would definitely meditate multiple times a week to this day though. Um, I do a lot of work around visual triggers and taking action in that space. So an example is um, that we, even though I don't know how or when this will unfold, we've gone ahead and had our house plans drawn up. And even though at this point in time, there is not the money to build the dream house. And then on my phone, that's my, I'm sure I know that you're listening <laughs> on an audio, but I'm showing Miffy here, you know, my screensaver is our house plan. So every time I open my phone, I'm seeing the house plans. It's a, it's a, just a little subliminal prompt that reminds me about where I'm going and keeping my eye on that goal or that prize of mine. So Okay. Again, different stages, different ways that I'm using tools, but yes. um, I don't have a specific practice. It's using different ones at different stages, but I definitely feel now like I've got a whole toolbox of strategies that I use when I want to shift my energy and mm-hmm. things that I'm able to do when I'm feeling lack or fear or any of the things in the space of money. Yeah, and what I'm hearing in that, Claire, is that it's sort of become default for you now, right? So it probably was a time when you were saying the affirmations and and faking it till you make it and all of those things that we do, right, when we're trying on this new way of being. And that somewhere along the line, it just becomes default. And it is part of that adjustment too, isn't it? We adjust into, we grow into living in abundance and being grateful and knowing that the universe is providing and and is aligned with what we are projecting out there and all of those things so I'm so what I'm really hearing in that is how you have kind of come along that journey and now it's not so much something that you have to consciously activate in yourself because it's activated you have grown into that Mm. person and and I love that on your your screensaver that that's your vision and it's trusting in the what as opposed to the how So you know what you want and you get out of the way around the how, because usually the universe shows up with something that you could never have imagined. You know, what are your thoughts, Claire, now around that process, that journey? If there's somebody listening who, you know, is kind of going, yeah, I get this stuff, but how how do I make a start? Or, you know, what do I, what do I need to do? How do I need to show up? You know, you mentioned visual triggers there. Can you... So just make some more suggestions around ways that we can really step into that for ourselves. Yeah. One of the best things that you can do is be educating yourself around money, around mindset. So listening to podcasts, reading books, I think is a really important foundational step in in learning to understand about how you can make more money. The next thing to do is then translate that into your belief systems around money. So noticing, oh, what's coming up for me? I'm feeling fear. I'm feeling scared. I'm feeling lack. And then the next step, of course, is taking aligned action. So whatever the thing is that you desire, are you taking steps towards its creation? So if you want um, to assign a brand new client in your business, are you getting out there in your marketing and talking about your services and your offering? Is there a way that you are actually putting the potential to create the outcome that it is that you say that you desire? So, yeah, Claire, if somebody wants to connect with you, follow you, uh, work with you, listen to your podcast, any of that stuff. Um, How do you work with people and what's the best way that people can kind of connect with 
your message and, and what you're all about. Yeah, for sure. So my website is quite easy. It's just clairewood.com. So C-L-A-R-E-W-O-O-D.com. And you can find the links to my social media there. I'm on Instagram quite a lot. Um, I'm at Claire underscore Wood underscore coach. Come along and follow over there. Drop me a message, say hi. And um, I also have my book, Intentional Profit, which again, you can grab on my website. Excellent. And your podcast as well, Claire, what's the name of your podcast? It's very creatively called the Claire Wood Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. And I have listened to several episodes and it's just lovely. You're you're so easy to listen to and you're so uplifting. You know, you come away from a podcast episode going, yeah, I can do this too. <laughs> oh, thank you, Miffy. I really appreciate that. Yeah, no, it's brilliant. And I have to say that I first met you, Claire, at a an online masterclass you did for the Mumboss Network, who I'm a member of here in Ireland, a, a female entrepreneur network. And it was just fantastic, this hour we spent with you uh, learning about money mindset. And it was just really cool. Um, and again, you come away feeling all inspired. So thanks for that. Oh, it's my pleasure. I, I love the fact that I get to talk to and work with people right across the the world and and help them to change the way that they think and feel about money. I feel very blessed. I love my job. Yeah. You know, we've talked about the various elements of the shift from poverty consciousness into sort of more abundant mentality and the worlds that we create as a result. I'm really interested in that and the whole timelines part of it and how we can change those timelines for ourselves. So thanks a million for just shedding light on those various parts of the process here uh, for us on the Pebble in My Shoe podcast. It's an absolute pleasure. Thanks so much for having me on. I hope you've enjoyed listening to this conversation with Claire as much as I did having it. The overriding theme that emerged for me is how we create worlds through our mindsets. Claire talked about choosing to be rich. Our mindset is a powerful thing and shapes how we experience the world. It seems it does more than that. It actually creates the world we inhabit. And it's more than believing in the life we want for ourselves. It's about taking aligned actions that allow us to live into that life. While it's money mindset we focused on in this conversation, I know from my own life that this same principle applies to everything we want to manifest. We must be the change we want to see. We must embody it and live as if until we are. Claire has a lovely podcast that's worth listening to if you're interested in getting some inspiration around money mindset and abundant thinking. I'm putting all her information in the show notes. As well as hosting this podcast, I'm also a personal growth coach. I help you work through emotional distress and discomfort, gain insight and deeper self-awareness, and help you take actions that support, nurture, and energize you. I provide a range of original personal growth resources and tools, mindfulness practices, a weekly blog, and a newsletter that you can subscribe to for updates from the Daisy Coaching Hub and exclusive content and offers. You can find all this and more on my website, www.daisycoaching.ie. Thank you for listening, and I look forward to sharing the next episode of The Pebble in My Shoe with you. Bye for now.